keep your Bibles open, let me pray, and we'll dive into this passage. And we've sung today, now unto the King who reigns over all and never changes or turns. Unfailing justice, unfading grace, whose promises remain. Heavenly Father, would we by uh, your word this morning uh, see how uh, your justice and your grace and your mercy uh, meet in the Lord Jesus. And so help us to trust your promises all the more. Amen. Uh, so after a week away, uh, last week as, as Bishop Lee came, uh, we're back in 1 Samuel today. Uh, as the tension of the narrative of 1 Sam, uh, Samuel ramps up another notch. Because uh, you, you'll remember if you've been around that, that Saul, uh, the people's king, chosen so that God's people could blend in and be just like the nations all around them has been rejected by God in favour of David, a man after God's own heart. Uh, But as we hit chapter 24 this morning, in God's timing, Saul is still there on the throne and he's not giving it up lightly. As time and time again, he pursues a fleeing David in order to kill David and keep his own sweaty fingers wrapped around the scepter of power. And after a close escape for David back in chapter 23, where he only survived because Saul was called away to battle. Well, with hardly a breath as we hit chapter 24, we're back in the chase. Look at verse 1. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goat's rocks. With spies everywhere, Saul's pursuit is relentless. It feels like it's only a matter of time until God's ruler-elect is chased down and defeated. Until, that is, nature comes calling. Because look at verse 3. And he, that's Saul, came to the sheepfolds, by the way, where there was a cave. And Saul went in to relieve himself. Now, the English here is meant to spare our blushes, uh, but the original language leaves us in no doubt that Saul needed a poo. And therefore, a bit of privacy from his men. And so with 3,000 warriors waiting outside, and he, no doubt, feeling as safe as houses, Saul then chooses for himself an appropriate cave in which to do his business. But look at the end of verse 3. Now David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of the cave. Imagine David's eyes accustomed to the dark, watching his nemesis, his would-be assassin, walking alone into his cave. Of all the caves in all the world, he walks into mine. And so Saul is literally caught with his pants down. And David's men are not too slow to attach significance to all the events unfolding before them. Verse 4, And the men of David said to him, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. This is the day, David, this is it. As David's men see what's happening before their eyes, as they see the opportunity to get rid of their pursuer, an opportunity for peace, an opportunity for David to claim the crown and for them stopping, to stop having to cower in caves, but instead party in palaces. Well, they can't help but take God's promises and bend them for their own purposes. Because the truth is, God hasn't said anything to David about handing Saul over to him. Nothing at all. Oh, he said that David would one day inherit the throne. But the nearest thing that God has said uh, has come to saying what David's men are claiming is back in verse 4 of chapter 23, when God promised to give Israel's enemy, the Philistines, into David's hands. Uh, But there was no mention of Saul there. But hey, why let the facts get in the, good, in the way of justifying a good opportunity, right? 
Uh, no, instead, think David's men, we'll, we'll just twist God's word to justify our ends, our purposes, speed up the whole coronation thing in our timings and not in God's. Go, go get him, David. And if you look closer here, there are echoes of Genesis 3 in the serpents. Did God really say in this passage? As the men of David tempt David, albeit with good intentions, to bend the truth, to bend God's will and to take power on his terms, in his timings, rather than to wait for God to work out his purposes his way. Oh, they're trying to take a shortcut to glory. And we know this, don't we? Uh, this, is the, this is the prosperity gospel that tells you suffering and heartache can be avoided if you just have enough faith. Uh, this is the well-meaning friend who, when you know the, the, the God-honoring thing, when you know, sorry, that the God-honoring thing to do is going to be painful for you as you try to do what is right in a world of of differing values, says to you, "Yeah, but God wouldn't want you to be unhappy, so just crack on." Ignoring that Jesus said, "The way to glory, the way to eternal joy, is to pick up your cross and follow Him." What are your shortcuts to glory? Where do you ignore the call to wait on God rather than to grasp the heaven now? Anyway, back to the story. As the stealthily and ominously, for the reader at least, uh, David begins to creep towards Saul. Look at verse 4. Then David arose and stealthily cut off, not Saul's head as we might expect, but a corner of Saul's robe. Uh, David, a man who, as we said a couple of weeks ago, is growing in stature, godliness, grace, and wisdom, relents from killing Saul, resists grasping at God's kingdom, instead cutting off just a corner of Saul's robe, which I'm assuming Saul, and I'm hoping Saul, had removed. Or, or I imagine it could have been a serious hindrance to his comfort break and would have left him with some stains to explain. Now, whilst David didn't kill Saul, nevertheless, cutting the robe here isn't without its own significance. Because uh, you'll know that robes have been uh, symbolic of, of power and control of the kingdom. Uh, so think about Jonathan, the crown prince. A few chapters back in chapter 18 and verse 4, when he gave his robe to David as a sign of him handing his power over to him. Or think back to what happened in chapter 15 and verse 28, when Saul tore Samuel's robe and Samuel used it as a visual aid of what the Lord would do to Saul into the future, tearing the kingdom from Saul and giving it to somebody who is better than Saul. And so whilst this is far better than David killing Saul, that David would even do this is a massive moment in the power struggle between David and Saul, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Which is clear there from how David feels the guilt and struggle of verse 6. Because David realises that he is grasping for something that although promised to him, isn't yet his. He's living in that tension of wanting the now when God has said, not yet. Because as we said at the beginning, whilst his reign is certain to one day end, nevertheless, Saul is still the God-anointed king of Israel. God has put Saul there, and it is up to God to remove him. And so verse 6, look down at verse 6. The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to put out my hand against him, seeing he is the Lord's anointed. So David persuaded his men with these words and did not permit them to attack. Saul. I mean, that's remarkable that David can say that of the man who is pursuing him. With 3,000 men, warriors outside of the cave. But David realizes the way to receive the promises of God is not to grab them in his own power, in his own strength, justifying the power grab through the bending of God's words and the swell of public opinion. No, it is simply to wait for God to work out his promises in his ways, by his hand, in his time. And so I think there are two, maybe three things for us to learn from this episode. The first is this. Uh, 
David teaches us to be faithful to God's ways, whatever our situation. So look at verse 6. Uh, and as you do, please recognize yourself in, in, in the ragtag bunch of men that have aligned themselves with David here. Of course they want David to slay Saul because that's the easy way out of the dark, dank cave of life that they're in. It's the easy way to reach their goals, to achieve their aims. And that, my friends, is us every time we're tempted to reject God's words and ways for the quick fix promises of the world. I know God said to do your relationship this way, but it makes so much more sense to do it like this, and everyone out there would tell you so. I, I know God says to be generous, but that just seems so counterintuitive to me getting the riches that I want. I, I know God said love your enemy, but I'd rather watch them bleed out from a thousand paper cuts that I inflict because that's how I get vengeance and satisfaction. I, I know God said pursue the truth, but let's be honest, a few lives will get me to heaven on earth more quickly as I rise up the ladder of success. I know God said, but everyone else around me is telling me something different. Popular opinion is telling me something different. All the voices I'm listening to are telling me something different, telling me not to suffer. So did God really say? We'll look at David again in verse 5 and 6 as he perhaps only at the last minute realizes something greater is going on. That someone greater is really on the throne. That God's plans and promises are God's plans and promises. And so they are not there for us to force or bend or twist or manipulate. Even when, even when the courts of public opinion are baying that we would. No, he understands. Even in that deep, dank, dark cave that God has something better for him. And David saw that right now in that moment, there was a king on the throne of God's kingdom who wasn't him. And so rather than slay him, rather than do battle with him, rather than chase glory and the easy ride for himself, David instead, verse eight, went out of the cave and called after Saul, my Lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth and paid homage. And again, isn't that remarkable? David honours God's king. How can David do that after all the pain and suffering that Saul has caused? Well, because behind David's homage to Saul, there is actually a greater homage of the Lord God himself. This is David saying, okay, God. You've said, you've promised that the kingdom will be mine one day. You've said that this despot on the throne will one day be removed. And so even in this wilderness that I find myself, even in this deep, dank cave of life, I am going to humble myself and trust you in your ways. I am not going to listen to the courts of public opinion. I am not going to look for shortcuts to glory. No, I am going to trust you and your ways and your plans, even when what, that, that, when, um, what looks like a shortcut to glory will come along. And friends, whilst we definitely know the struggles of life in the wilderness as we wait for Christ to return and bring us to glory, and whilst at times it feels like we live in a world ruled by the souls of this world, we also know that God has chosen a better king. We know that despite appearances at times, there is no despot on the throne of God's kingdom anymore. Now we have a greater king, greater even than David, that we follow, a king whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. And King Jesus has made some great, great promises to help us remain faithful throughout the wilderness as we await his return to bring us to glory. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest, he promises. In my father's house are many rooms, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you may be where I am also, he promises. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, 
I am the resurrection and the life. No one gets to the Father except through me. Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in, this, uh, become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. He's made us great promises. We have with Jesus a great future. So ask yourself, where this morning do you need to stop taking shortcuts? Stop trying to remove Jesus from the throne of your life. Stop trying to seek your glory your way and instead, like David does before Saul, pay homage to God's anointed king as you trust God to work his promises out his ways by his hand in his time. Where do you need to stop acting to bring yourself power and glory and instead act in trusting worship and obedience to the one who has all the power and glory? Be faithful to God's ways, whatever our situation. But as we do that, we must also, secondly, be patient. Be patient in the wilderness of waiting. You see, some of you right now, even as we gather here this morning, are feeling in that space that David and his men were experiencing. And if you're not there right now, there will be times in your life when you will be there. Times when you'll understand and feel the pain of a world that is not as it should be. Controlled by evil and heartache and suffering. When you know a world that hates Jesus and wants nothing more than to keep him from the throne. There are people here today who are feeling the impacts of injustice and unrighteousness. Who know the desperation of illness and of death. Who have and who are experiencing the impact of sin in and on their life. People who are crying out, how long will this go on? How long will I suffer? More than that, actually, who are asking, why? Why is this going on? I mean, think about it. If God has promised us all that he's promised us, if he said he'll come and make all things perfect, that he'll build a kingdom where there'll be no more tears, death, mourning, crying, or pain, then why the heck are we waiting? Come, Lord Jesus. And of course, that's the question that backdrops all the events of the cave at Wild, Rock, uh, Wild Goat's Rock, isn't it? It's surely the question that David's men are asking as they watch Saul drop his kegs. This is the question that often leaves us floundering around in the darkness of suffering and tempted to give up on Jesus and replace him with our own inadequate shortcuts to glory. When, when God, back in chapters 15 and 16, has rejected Saul and chosen David as his successor... Why do we have to go through all of this? Why, when Jesus has risen in glory, are we here facing whatever it is tomorrow morning brings? And the answer is this. It's not daddy. It's this. And I say this, I do say this, knowing that there are people hurting in this room and knowing that others will hurt into the future. And so I don't say it lightly. But we have a now, so we know God's promises are secure, and yet we have a not yet. We are not yet in glory. And why? Well, I think there's more than one reason, but certainly one reason that we learn here is that waiting is good for us. Waiting is good for us because waiting is the melting pot of our sanctification. It is through the waiting that God grows us and shapes us and calls us to trust in him. Uh, just listen to how Paul in uh, Romans 5 puts it. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, 
we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We already have that. Through him, we also have obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of glory. It's coming. The hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Friends, waiting, waiting in the dark, dank cave of life lifts our eyes to Jesus. And we see that in David's life too. You see, I said a couple of weeks ago that in chapters 20 to 24, the story of David as he flees Saul is, is one of growth and trusting obedience and welcoming outcasts like himself. As David learns to identify with this ragtag bunch of blokes who follow him. Because they don't need a king who has everything put on a plate for them. They don't need a king who only knows the victory over Goliath and not the crushing pain of defeat and hurt and being pursued. No, they, they need a king who can sympathise with them in their weakness. And so in God's timings and goodness, that is what God moulds David to be. And Jesus knew this too. Do you remember when in Matthew 4, he goes out to his own wilderness? And there Satan shows up and tells him, hey, Jesus, you don't, you don't need to suffer. Take the kingdom now in your strength. You don't need to go through the weakness of the cross, through the humiliation of suffering to bring in your kingdom. No, just take it by force, Jesus. Go get it. Take the shortcut to glory. But Jesus knew as David that God's kingdom taken by force is not the kingdom of God at all. Because God doesn't work that way. And anyway, think about this. Who wants a king who can't identify with them in their suffering? Who wants a king who hides in citadels and palaces? Who wants a king who doesn't experience the pain and heartache of sin and death and of coffins and of graves? A king like that would have no identity with nor compassion for his people. Oh, he'd just be a proud taskmaster. But Jesus knows even this morning, he knows your suffering. Your fears, your tears, your hurts. Because whilst they might be different, he's lived them. He's experienced them. He has seen the sick and the troubled. He's experienced pain and heartache. He knows betrayal and he understands injustice. Oh, it is, it is through the journey of life that David, that Jesus can understand truly what it is to be gentle and lowly and patient and kind. And it's through the pains of life that David, that Jesus can learn to lean on and trust their heavenly father. Not my will, but yours be done. And it is through the pains of life that Jesus calls us to patiently trust in him and follow him as he goes to work to shape us and mold us as kingdom people. It is through the pains of life that we learn not to grasp for the kingdom through the shortcuts that we've spoken about, but to receive the kingdom in God's good and generous time. And so we, even in our suffering, are to cling to Christ, to run with him, to listen to him and strive to follow him. And it is through the sufferings of life that the kingdom of glory and mercy and grace and compassion of Jesus will shine, will shine all the more brightly and draw us ever closer into his glorious kingdom. It's as we experience actually the darkness of the cave that our eyes will see ever more brightly the wonder of God's glorious kingdom of light. The city on a hill that shines in the darkness. And we see that in verse 17, don't we? 
Because a soul sees his own unrighteousness, his, sin, his sin-fueled ways of leading the kingdom, well, only then does David's mercy and grace towards him shine ever more brightly. Look at it. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? It is only as we understand and experience the brokenness of this world, it is only as we discover the brokenness of our own heart, the temptation to do war with God's king, that we see how brightly, how beautifully God's kingdom glows, how marvelously God's anointed truly how marvelous God's anointed truly is, how generous his grace towards us, so that we might pursue him ever more fervently. So friends, be patient in suffering. Because there's better to come. There's a kingdom of light for which you and I are being prepared. A kingdom of mercy and grace and peace. So look out from the darkness of your dark, damp cave and see the glory of Jesus. The promises of God and allow him to shape you into Christ trusters. Leading you verse 17, verse 19, verse 21 into a kingdom of righteousness, of justice and of peace. The kingdom of God. And it's these kingdom values, justice, righteousness, peace, that actually allow David to be patient, isn't it? Did you notice that back in verses 8 to 15? As David goes out to address Saul in verse 8, he says to him, Hey, Saul, you know I could have killed you back there, don't you? Perfect opportunity. But I didn't. I have not sinned against you, despite being on the wrong end of your evil intentions, despite you hunting me down like a dead dog or a flea, I will not put my hand against you. I will not grab for power in my strength, in my timings, in my way. And why? How is it that David was so able to relent from striking out and let Saul go? How can we rest and trust God in the wilderness among the pain and hardship of a world of sin and injustice? Well, I think at the very least it's because of verse 15. May the Lord therefore be judge and give sentence between me and you and see to it and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. David knows and we must know that there is a God in heaven who is a just God and that one day, even though it wasn't the right time in the cave, God's justice would be served. Evil would be dealt with that righteousness would win and that God's glorious kingdom would be established. And that, my friends, I think is the key to how we, even in our suffering right now, keep going and keep trusting, even as we face hardship and struggle, as you face persecution and injustice, as you know hurts and pains and frustrations, as you experience the struggle of life in the wilderness. Because we know, because God has promised it, That in the end, all sorrow, all suffering, all injustice, all evil, all sin will be dealt with by a mighty and just God. David knows that all enemies to God's kingdom, whether Saul or the Philistines, whether sin or death, will be struck down and overcome. And so in the cave, he doesn't need to grasp for righteousness in his strength. He could rely on the character and promises and righteousness of God. Now, now please don't hear me as saying, therefore, if you're a victim of sin or unrighteousness, that you should just shrug your shoulders and ignore it. You shouldn't seek to resolve it. No, no, no. The the police, the courts, tribunals, other means of seeking justice and righteousness, they're all good things. Christians are called to fight for justice. Although, caveat, I am saying from David's own actions that you shouldn't resolve it in ways that won't bring glory to Jesus. Keep checking your motives and your actions. But we know even from this passage that at times the innocent suffer. If you want a greater example of that, then just turn your eyes to the cross. And so how good is it to know that God will one day sit in judgment over all sin, over all suffering, over all injustice, and banish them from our presence 
as he deals with it once and for all. That's how David waited. That's how he could not grasp. And it's how we can wait even in the wilderness of life. Knowing that God is just and that God is good. What is it we sing in the kids' song sometimes? He's going to banish sin and shame. But maybe that's not so reassuring to you this morning because you're here and you know only too well of those times when you have rejected God's king. Those times when you've sought shortcuts to glory. Those times when you've dealt in unrighteousness and injustice. What happens then? Well, you too can rest, relaxed this morning. Because how good is it to know that Jesus is a better David, who even in our sin, our transgression, our meted out injustice and our unrighteousness, for those times where we, like the blokes in the cave with David, have put ourselves up against him and sought to silence the Lord's anointed so that we could reign over our own life. How good is it that Jesus can come and, and will, verse 19, let his enemies, look at, look at that verse, verse 19, let his enemies go away safe. Verse 21, lead them into a, a promise of everlasting peace. Something we certainly don't deserve. Because Jesus, like David, is not only a king of justice, but he is a king of mercy and grace. A king through whom, in fact, justice and mercy meet. As Jesus goes through the wilderness of suffering on our behalf, identifying with us through life, even into his death. And even there, taking upon himself our sin, our shame, our unrighteousness, our pursuit of his throne, our sweaty grasping for power, and he nails it to the cross with himself so that God can reign his justice out on Jesus. And his enemies become his friends as they go free. What wonder to say with Saul, for if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away safe? Oh, we were enemies of Jesus. We have constantly put ourselves against the Lord's anointed. And yet this king is so wonderful, so kind, lets us go away safe into his covenant of peace. More than that, actually, he invites us to be his people, to dwell with him, not in a dark, damp cave, but in a kingdom of glorious light. And so rest in his grace. Be faithful whatever your situation. And be patient even through the wilderness of life. Know that justice and mercy stand together and Jesus is working to bring you home. So stand fast. And follow the king. Let's pray. Now unto the king who reigns over all and never changes or turns. Unfailing justice, unfading grace, whose promises remain. Oh, Heavenly Father, wouldn't you by your spirit this morning impress deeply on our hearts and in our minds how that glorious King Jesus is, how true your promises are, how merciful and gracious our King is. Help us to be a people who know what it is to trust in your justice in your timing, in your goodness, in your grace, and in your promises. Father, I pray for those of us who are gathered here this morning who are
feeling like they're in that cave of darkness and suffering. That father perhaps tempted to seek shortcuts to glory, shortcuts to the way out. Draw them to yourself this morning. By your spirit, comfort them. Help them to trust ever more deeply in King Jesus. To listen to him. To walk with him. And to trust in him and his timings. Help us all to rejoice that you are a God of justice. Help us wait on that. But at the same time, Heavenly Father, we know that there is suffering and pain and hurt and hardship in this world. And so we do beg, come Lord Jesus. We've seen glimpses of the kingdom of light. We want to see it in full. Restore us to the people you have made us to be, we pray. Amen.